is Emily Seiner. I'm an enterprise reporter here at Nashville Public Radio, which means basically I ask people the most interesting questions I can come up with and then talk about their answers. So in that vein, I'm going to ask you a question. How many of you know what a podcast is? Raise your hand if the answer is yes. Okay, a lot of you. Well, just in case, here's the definition. A podcast is a digital audio file made available on the internet for downloading. For the purposes of this talk, you can think of it as a radio show online. Second question. This is apparently the official icon for podcasts, according to the internet. So second question. How many of you listen to podcasts? Okay, well, if you are raising your hand, you are in the minority in this country. Only about one in three Americans, as of a study last spring, had ever heard a single podcast episode in their life, even though podcasts have been around for years. Or, as one successful radio producer put it, nobody listens to podcasts. <laughs> nobody listens to podcasts. Think about it. People listen to the radio, and people go online, but do they really go online to listen to the radio? I mean, obviously, some of you raise your hands, so some people do. But take a look. If you look at the top downloaded podcasts last year on iTunes, they were either, A, already on the radio, like This American Life or Fresh Air, so they already had a huge audience built in. Or B, they were basically just online-only talk shows, like an hour of comedy or back and forth between hosts, which is relatively cheap and easy to produce. Because who would want to spend tons of time and money into making a podcast really, really good, like on the radio good, if nobody will listen to it? Now, as it turns out, if you make a podcast really, really good, you can get people to listen. But it takes a little reinvention. And it's not just podcasts. What I'm going to talk about today is how radio in general is reinventing itself for the web in a thoughtful yet still pretty experimental way. And what that means is the most innovative voices in radio aren't just following their audience. Because for the most part, their audience isn't going online yet to listen to audio. Instead, they're giving their audience a reason to follow them. So, for example, say you want to make a podcast with great reporting and producing. It's going to be pretty expensive. So how do you get people to listen? To answer this, let's take a look at the best example in podcast history so far, Serial. <laughs> Serial, which has this lovely logo, was a podcast that came out last fall about the real-life murder of a teenager and the trial of her ex-boyfriend. It had the quality of an on-the-radio radio show like This American Life. In fact, it was a producer from This American Life, Sarah Koenig, who created it. But here's the thing. Except for the very first episode, it never actually aired on the radio. And people still listened. I mean, they listened big. It was downloaded an estimated 40 million times. Dozens of media outlets wrote about how surprised they were that it was so popular when it wasn't even on the radio, which, of course, only made it more popular. The proof of its success, to me, was purely anecdotal. I actually didn't listen to Serial last fall when it came out, which I feel kind of bad about. And um, I came to seriously regret that, because every time I told someone I worked for public radio, all they wanted to talk about was Serial. <laughs> It was a freaking cultural phenomenon. So how did Sarah Koenig know it would be worth putting all this time and energy and money into something that was only online? The short answer is she didn't know. In fact, remember that quote at the beginning, nobody listens to podcasts? It was Sarah Koenig herself who said that. <laughs> she said that's what she thought when she started making cereal. She wasn't expecting it to go big. She was simply experimenting with a pretty new concept for podcasts. And here's what was new. The name of Serial itself comes from the idea that it's a radio series, one single story told over several weeks, which is similar, of course, to television. And television series draw people in, especially ones about crime. They create buzz and suspense from week to week. Serial was simply borrowing that idea, and it worked really well. The key here is that Sarah Koenig didn't wait for huge masses of people to start listening to podcasts before making one that was really good. Instead, she experimented. She found a hook that podcasts hadn't really explored before, and she gave people a reason to start listening. She let her audience follow her. Now, for many of you, this concept is not revolutionary. For example, if you work in a startup, this is probably all you think about. I mean, following an existing audience isn't even an option. You have to go out and find them. But once a company establishes itself and develops loyal users or listeners, there might be less of a desire to experiment. 
There's a tendency to do what already works, to follow your audience instead. And I think in media, this happens a lot. And on one hand, it makes a lot of sense. It's really hard being a news organization these days. You don't have a lot of resources to experiment with. You don't want to mess up what you already have. But I've seen a lot of news organizations rely on simply researching what their audience already likes and just giving it to them. For example, there's a great parody of this in the TV show Parks and Recreation, where the main character, Leslie Nope, um, is being interviewed on a public radio station in the fictional town of Pawnee, Indiana. Now, I can't show you the clip for copyright reasons, so I'm going to do my best to reenact it. <laughs> so, the public radio host asks Leslie to introduce the next segment, and she reads, next we have jazz plus jazz equals jazz. It's a recording of Benny Goodman played over a separate recording of Miles Davis. And when the music starts, it just sounds terrible. <laughs> no one should have thought this was a good idea. But the radio host leans over and says, research shows our listeners love jazz. <laughs> now, obviously, this is just a parody. But the point is, sometimes following your audience doesn't get you very far. Another example in my field, nobody shares audio online. This entered the public radio conversation about a year ago. Nobody shares audio online. Think about it. People share videos online. 128 million people <laughs> shared that one. <laughs> they share gifts of dogs online. That was a top post for BuzzFeed in 2012. But when NPR puts together a seven-minute story that's so good, listeners can't even get out of their cars until it's over, seriously, almost no one goes on Facebook and says, hey, friends, don't just click on this link but listen to the story. Now, maybe you do. Maybe you do go on Facebook and click the link and even sit at your computer for seven minutes and listen to the story, but almost no one else is. So there are two ways to look at this. One, follow your audience. If people aren't listening to audio online, there's really no need to put it online. I mean, don't waste your time. But some folks at NPR decided to go down the second route, the same kind of route that Sarah Koenig and Serial went down. They said, if people aren't sharing audio online, what can we do differently to make people want to share it? How can we make audio go viral? So to answer this, they looked at places that had already worked. So Serial was long-form audio and looked at long-form video or TV. The stories we do are shorter, so NPR looked at sites like YouTube and BuzzFeed. For example, they found that short videos tend to be played more. So they said, let's try making audio stories that are 90 seconds or less, low time commitment. They said, we need more buzz from the headline. Tell me why I should listen. Make me want to listen. Think upworthy, but maybe less sensational. <laughs> and finally, audio is king. When 128 million people watch a video of a kid's reaction to anesthesia after going to the dentist, it's because they know they can't get the same experience just by reading about it. You have to watch it to understand. So in the same way, this audio needs to be exciting and irreplaceable. So <clears throat> this is where Nashville Public Radio and I came in. NPR came to us and said, we want you to do what you do best, create audio stories. But we want you to do it specifically for the web. Short, compelling, you have to click and listen to understand. I was the reporter working with NPR on this project, and for my first attempt at a viral audio story, I created what's called a news explainer. I explain the status of gay rights in Tennessee in one minute, in a way that NPR describes as snappy, which you'll be able to hear in a second. And just a caveat, this was published last June, so some of the information is slightly outdated. College Dale, Tennessee's done it, Knoxville's done it, now Nashville could become the third city in the state to give its employees domestic partnership benefits. This means if you're on Metro's payroll, you could extend your job's health insurance and pension plan to your partner, no matter if you're gay or straight. You have to give three pieces of proof showing that you live together, you share living expenses, and oh yeah, you're not married to anyone else. 
Then you have to sign a form saying that you're sharing an intimate and committed relationship of mutual caring that is intended to be lifelong. Now, according to recent polls, the majority of Tennessee voters support benefits for same-sex domestic partners, but don't support same-sex marriage. Several private companies give these benefits, like Nissan USA, which is headquartered just outside Nashville. But the state has a constitutional amendment defining marriage as being between a man and a woman. A Tennessee judge recently ruled that the state had to recognize the marriage of three gay couples, but that was later overturned. Emily Seiner, Nashville Public Radio. You think as a radio reporter, oh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> you think as a radio reporter I'd get used to hearing the sound of my own voice, but it still makes me cringe sometimes. So anyway, we published a story, posted it to Facebook, and waited. And then a few minutes later, something curious happened. Our website crashed. <laughs> I kid you not. So many people were trying to click on that link at once that it crashed our website. And then we revived the site, posted it to Facebook a few days later, and it happened again. The site crashed. Probably my biggest accomplishment in Nashville Public Radio so far <laughs> has been to compel the station to get a bigger web server because of this story. <laughs> so anyway... <laughs> Anyway, even with the site down for several hours, it was shared on social media 922 times, 2,800 people listened to it. That's about 50 to 100 times our normal online listenership. By our standards, this story went viral. <laughs> now, a few months later, I put together this piece. I went to Groon Guitars here in Nashville, and I asked George Groon, the owner, to play me the least expensive guitar they had, the most expensive guitar they had, and one in the middle. And I put it together in a 90-second audio story. Take a listen. You're about to hear three guitars. One of them is the cheapest Groon has to offer, another is mid-range, and a third is the store's most expensive acoustic. So, which one is this? It doesn't have the depth, the mellowness. It's a new baby tailor. Uh, it's a guitar that we sell for under $300. George Gruen says it's not bad, but it's just not as good as this one. got power and dynamic range. And this is a hand-built guitar. That's a custom Martin made with Adirondack spruce and Madagascar rosewood. And it rings up at $5,000, but still not as good as this one. It's a 1938 Martin, well-made, rich sound, and pretty rare. Uh, this is an instrument which, when new, in early 1938, cost $100, and today is priced at $100,000. So I asked George Groom, does a higher price always mean better guitar? You can certainly find examples where something that may be $50,000 does not sound one iota better than something else that's ten. In general, there is a correlation that more expensive instruments sound better. But is it an exact correlation that's going to hold true every time? The simple answer is no. We got a lot of um, concerned comments from listeners because apparently the last guitar is out of tune, which I didn't, <laughs> I didn't realize. <laughs> Oops. Um, so if we thought our other stories were going viral, this one went epidemic. It was shared 5,800 times on social media, 18,000 people listened, I also put together a little audio quiz online where people could listen to each guitar individually and then guess which one is which. The number of people who started that was 32,000. These are incredibly successful numbers for us. And given how huge they are compared to our normal online listeners, we can confidently say we didn't just tap into our existing audience, we created one. Now, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> am I saying the future, oh, excuse me, <coughs> I have a cold this week, of course. Am I saying the future of radio will be or should be either TV style, true crime podcasts, or 90 second viral audio stories? No, 
I think there will be a high demand for great traditional radio for a long time. But these examples have changed the way we think about the value of our radio stories on the web. When Serial became wildly successful, it wasn't just Serial that became more popular. Podcasting and public radio in general became more popular. When people come to our site to listen to a story about guitars, they also stay to look at the other work we're doing. We've seen that in our page views. So yeah, we could just sit back, play it safe, do what we've always done, put your best radio shows only on the radio, focus your creative energy on seven minute driveway moment stories, not 90 second web posts. But this mindset, playing it safe, is a luxury no matter what industry you're in. Because the world is always changing. And if you lag behind your audiences long enough, you will lose them. So instead, you pull a serial or a viral audio. You experiment. You borrow from things that have already worked. You still do whatever you do best, and you put it out there. Because sometimes the only reason people haven't followed you yet is because you haven't even tried. You have to give them something to follow first. Thank you.